It must be done swiftly, Forrester. I demand that. Swiftly and surely tidied up. We're doing all we can, Mr. Acton. No local villain can get away with this. Burgling my house, ransacking my library. Of course, we can't be sure the culprit is a local man. Well, it hardly seems the work of a city professional, does it? Does it? Perhaps not. But I do try not to leap to conclusions. You don't seem to leap to anything. Stroll, more like. Well, we have been able to establish from the inventory you provided for us and from our interviews with your servants. Which took long enough. They have work to do, you know. Yes, sir. We've established exactly what the thief made off with. Which is? An odd assortment. Tell me, then, what's missing? Uh, Two plated candlesticks, an ivory letterweight, one volume of Pope's Homer, a small oak barometer, and... uh... And what? And a ball of twine, sir. The Rygate Squires by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson And featuring Peter Davison as Inspector Forrester With Struan Roger, Roger Hammond and Terence Edmund The Rygate Squires It was on the 14th of April, 1887 that I received a telegram from Lyon informing me that Sherlock Holmes was lying ill in the Hotel Doulon. Within 24 hours, I was in his sick room. His iron constitution had broken down under the strain of his investigation into the colossal schemes of Baron Maupertuis, the most accomplished swindler in Europe. Holmes' exertions had been immense and had extended over two months. Now his hotel room was literally ankle-deep in congratulatory telegrams, but I found him prey to the blackest depression. There we are. All done. And I'm happy to say there's nothing at all formidable in your symptoms. Yes, so the local quacks already told me. (laughs) Rather brusquely. Exhaustion, Holmes. Complete exhaustion. Yes. So complete. Almost? Almost what, old man? Oh, very good. You frighten the man. Such weariness. You can rest here. It's an attractive, quiet place. You can lie here and bask in the knowledge that all Europe is ringing with your name. Oh, I'm weary of all that, too. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, weary of adulation. The respect of a one. <laughs> Yeah, the fellow I put behind bars has more intelligence than all of them put together. Mm. There's a telegram here from royalty. The work of a secretary, no doubt. This will pass, Holmes. Give yourself time. A week or two, then you'll be back on your feet. Mm. I'm glad you've come, Watson. I'm happy to be here. Yes. You can make the arrangements. What arrangements? For the journey. I intend to leave here tomorrow. Another hour, Watson. Only one more hour, and we'll be back in London. <laughs> My city. Streets, river, the voices, all the criminals and narcs there to welcome me home. Mrs. Hudson will welcome you home. Yes, it might even be a pleasure to see Inspector Lestrade again. <laughs> I hope it will be some time before he comes calling. I'll, I'll take your advice, old man. Never fear. <laughs> Doctor's orders, friend's advice. <laughs> Just you wait. You will watch me thrive. Resurrected the moment we pull into Victoria. Just wait and see. And I did see. Within an hour of his arrival at Baker Street, Holmes relapsed into that dreadful lethargy, that weak and melancholy state that had so alarmed me in Lyon, and alarmed him too, I think. What he might do to try to escape from that condition was cause for extreme concern. I thought some change of surroundings might help, a week of springtime in the country, perhaps but I knew trips to the country with no villain to pursue held no attractions for Holmes. Some diplomacy was needed. Holmes, do you recall a friend of mine, Reginald Acton? Yes, Reginald. Yes, I recall the name. 
I don't believe I've met the fellow. Uh, no, 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 you haven't. But I think you should. Mm, why? He has a place near Rygate. And uh, has invited me there for a few days of relaxation. If you're keen to go to Surrey, Watson, please do. He says that if you would come with me, he will be more than happy to extend his hospitality to you also. You quote from his letter. Yes. Will you come? Uh, I'll do well enough here, I think. As your friend, Holmes, and as a doctor, I strongly advise you to take advantage of this invitation. A change of air, a change of habit. Mm, do you have uh, one particular habit in mind? Oh, you know I do. Cocaine. In your present weak condition, indulging in that pathological and morbid game could at last rob you of the great powers with which you've been endowed. Oh, now you quote from your own prepared speech. I fear if I leave you alone, you will endow. You are agitated, Doctor. I recommend a short holiday for you. <sighs> and you? Is it um, a bachelor establishment? Yes. yes. And I won't be expected to listen to you and your friends' reminiscences <laughs> about youthful days together? You will be allowed the fullest freedom. Hmm. Well, I'll have one more pipe full and give you my decision. And a week after our return from Lyon, we were under Acton's roof. I have to say, he's not quite what I expected. He never is. More vigour was what I was looking for. More an air of... more vim. He is here to rest, as I said. And wouldn't stay to try my port. Not a man for the vintage, then. Ah, uh, it's not his vice, no. Ah, thank you. I know you'll find it acceptable. Mm. Ah, excellent. Too many years since you and I shared a glass, John. Yes, so it is. <clears throat> You'll have read about the affair of the Netherlands Sumatra Company. Of course. Baron, what's his name? Mopetry. Mopetry. Bought to book. Mm. Another triumph for Sherlock Holmes. He worked no less than 15 hours a day on the case for over two months. And more than once, he kept on the trail five days at a stretch. Hmm. Even he couldn't escape some nervous reaction to that. Grand matters of politics and finance. <laughs> He'll hardly be interested in my small scare. Your scare? Last Monday, Watson, I was burgled. Some damnable lout had the gall to break into Reginald Acton's house. This very room, in fact. Yeah. Ransacked the place, turned it upside down, drawers burst open, cupboard locks forced. I'll have him horsewhipped before he's jailed. If that young sluggard Forrester can summon up the speed to get after him, it must be some kind of imbecile if he thought he could rile me and get away with it. Well, uh, perhaps he doesn't know you. Might he not be an outsider? Well, it wasn't artfully done, I can tell you that, and I'm no detective. Someone who travelled to break and enter, you'd expect to have some skill. This was a bungled job. In what way bungled? Ah, Holmes. We didn't hear you come in. Ah, you were so enthralled by Mr. Acton's tale. Please continue. How did the thief, or, or thieves, betray their artlessness? They came in by this very same French window, I take it. How did you know that? I had the lock repaired immediately. Exactly. What? Oh, I see, yes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes at work. Very good. As you say, you're convinced it was the work of amateurs. Amateurs or madmen, judging by their hall. Odds and ends were all they got away with. Nothing of value or significance. A couple of candlesticks, letter weight. They seemed to have grabbed hold of anything they could get. Were they disturbed? Holmes. No, they had all the time in the world. No one in the house had a thing. So why include a ball of twine in their booty? Why indeed? Holmes. It's all right, Watson. I shall leave the matter in Forrester's hands. He's of the county police, is he? Yes, Inspector's his title, but he's hardly more than a boy. And infuriatingly cautious. Well, I've been called that myself. Uh, now, if you don't mind, gentlemen, I'll retire.
Your grounds are splendid, Mr. Acton, and their sweet air has a decidedly sedative effect, just as you predicted, Watson. Hair trigger. Huh. Oh! Not like you to be up so early. Unless you've been awake all night. No, no, I, I did sleep. Uh, not well, I confess. Your country air is not as powerful a sleeping draught as some I know. Mm. <laughs> I'd rather the din of London than that cacophony of birds at dawn. No, I'm admiring your friend's collection of firearms. He has some magnificent specimens. It's been an interest of his for many years. Ah. Breakfast all prepared, I see. Collier flintlock revolver. Yeah. Bacon done perfect. Collier bridge loader. And sausages. Mm. Lipold navy coat. Mmm, kidneys it's too. Engraved, I'm sure, by Gustav Young. Yeah. I slept soundly, and my appetite's wide awake. Will you not join me? And here, a gap. What gap? Uh, it's here, where the more modern items are displayed. Gun is missing. And this surely wasn't among the odds and ends the thieves got away with. No, I think Acton himself may have taken that. Really? Mm, he said last night he'd take some protection to bed with him. A gang of burglars, however clumsy, is hardly likely to crack the same crib twice in a matter of days. I told him that. But the business has made him rather jittery. Yes, and fierce. He has a, a more uncertain temper than I look for in a bosom friend of yours, Watson. Oh, I haven't seen him for some years. He's changed. The responsibilities of managing a large estate he says, and a growing one. Damnosa hereditas. Morning, gentlemen. This bare-faced young fellow here, believe it or not, is Inspector Forrester, and he insists on speaking with Mr. Holmes. No, no, not insist, but I would appreciate a word. Not much of your time. How do you do, Inspector Forrester? Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you what an honour it is at last to meet Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. Oh. Thank you. And uh, allow me to introduce Dr. John Watson. Of course. How do you do, sir? Inspector? I'm an avid reader of your accounts of Mr. Holmes's work. Oh, really? What can I do for you, Inspector? I did warn him that you might pull the rug from under him. And remember my warning, Holmes. So, another burglary, you say? There was a break-in, sir, last night at the Cunninghams. So it is a local maniac. But more than that. This time it's murder. Murder, indeed. Well, now. Holmes, please. Inspector Forrester, why don't you join us at this... Excellent breakfast, and tell us your story at leisure. I'm told you're admirably methodical, as I am. Both Mr Cunningham's father and son saw the intruder running off across the garden and over the hedge, leaving William Kerwin, their coachman, shot dead. Could either father or son provide a description? Only that he was of middle size and dressed in black. Yes, and this William Kerwin? A decent enough man, so far as we know. He's been in the Cunningham service for years, unmarried, lived at the lodge with his mother. Mm, and the shooting took place shortly before midnight. Why would Kerwin be at the main house at that hour? We first tried to find out from his mother, but she's very old and deaf. She was never bright, and this shock has made her half-witted. We can get nothing from her. But there's this paper. It was found between finger and thumb of the dead man. Mm, a fragment torn from a larger sheet. One, two, three. Seven words in blue ink. You'll observe the hour written there as the very time Kerwin was shot. Yes, I do, sir, observe. Would you care to examine this, Watson? No, I'd really rather not. And I'd rather you didn't either. Ah, forgive the good doctor, Inspector. He's grumpy this morning, didn't sleep well. <laughs> On this torn corner of paper are seven words. At quarter to twelve, learn what may be. Oh. <laughs> this is of extraordinary interest. At quarter to twelve, learn what may be. Seven words on a two-inch scrap? Part of a remarkable document, I assure you. I'd be grateful for any pointers you could give, sir. Forgive me, Holmes, but I must be blunt. Inspector Forrester, Mr. Holmes is here to convalesce after a serious illness. As his doctor, any involvement in a murder case I have to view as a threat to his full recovery. Oh, Dr. Watson is, of course, correct. Thank you. I cannot become actively involved in your investigation. I understand, of course. I hope you'll forgive me. I intrusion. will, however, take all his advice and enjoy a health-giving stroll in the fresh air he thinks so highly of. Perhaps I could accompany you to your next port of call, Inspector. Kerwin may have torn the fragment from his murderer's hand, or the other way around. The murderer may have torn the rest of the sheet from him. Young Mr. Cunningham did see them resting yeah, together. Inspector, maybe pause a moment. Of course. Dr. Watson is more in the right than I believed. I'm not yet strong again. Oh. 
This is tiresome. I'm sorry, sir. Now, now the note reads as though it were an appointment. Let us suppose for a moment that it was sent to Kerwin. Now, whoever wrote it could not have taken it. Otherwise, the message could have been given by word of mouth. So, 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 who delivered the note? Almost certainly the postman, sir. I made inquiries. Kerwin received a letter yesterday by the afternoon post. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to work with you, Forrester. Work with me? Mm. What were you striding out for when I so annoyingly held you back? I thought perhaps you might like to take a look at the scene of the crime. Capital idea. But first, let's examine poor dead Kerwin. Yes, a man of about 45. 46, we believe. Huh? Uh, five foot four. Exactly. Hmm. Medium build, nine stone, five or six. Thinning hair. Uh, full set of teeth. Plainly but respectably dressed. Suit far from new but well looked after. His mother's a seamstress. Uh, she won't mend this. No. What's your opinion of the wound, Inspector? A revolver, probably. Yes, from a distance of something over four yards. No powder blackening on the clothes. Right. And in his pockets? Nothing of interest. It's all here. Hmm? It's handkerchief, pocket knife, one and fourpence halfpenny. The handkerchief is spotless. Hmm. Mother's care again. So, what can you tell me about his employers? I should have some knowledge of them before we meet. The son, Alec Cunningham, I don't know well. He spends most of his time in London, but he's been here constantly for the last two months. A smart young man, very lively. His father's a slower type altogether. Gloomy, even. He is, I suppose, our leading squire about here. Mm. How long he'll remain, sir, of course, is in doubt. Mm, Why is that? The lawsuit. I I'm sorry, I assumed you knew, being a friend of Mr Acton. No, I'm Mr Acton's guest, but I met him for the first time yesterday. He has a lawsuit against the Cunninghams, some dispute over land. Oh, interesting. The lawyers have been at it with both hands for years. Mr Acton and old Mr Cunningham are about worn out with it. I think that's why young Alec's more at home these days, to support his father. Yes, and unfortunately, Mr Acton has no son and must deal with matters on his own. Uh, if you don't mind my tagging along with you, why don't we take up your first good notion and visit the scene of the crime? Well, Inspector, in spite of the fact I've shown you all this before, I'm happy to do so again. An honour indeed to have a renowned London detective investigate our sordid little crime. Oh, it's, it's Inspector Forrester's investigation. He's been kind enough to let me tag along. So, what can I do for you? If you would indicate again where and how the events you witnessed took place. Certainly. Uh, you're standing, Mr Holmes, on the very spot poor Kerwin died. Still, I expect you've stood on many such spots. Where were you, Mr Cunningham? Uh, when he died, I was kneeling beside him. Before that, I was in my bedroom, smoking a last pipe. Where's that? Uh, where is what? Your bedroom. Which window? Uh, that one. Uh, second story, directly above the kitchen oh, door here. Yes. And your father's? The one next to mine. I see. Do go on. Uh, right. Uh, I, I heard... my Ker interruption, Inspector. I'm sorry. Ah. I heard uh, Kerwin call for help, and of course I came dashing down to see what was up. I got as far as the foot of the stairs and saw Kerwin and some villain wrestling right here. The door was open, then? Of course. It had been forced open. You can still see the signs of it. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, Kerwin was tackling a burglar, you see. Um, didn't the inspector tell you that? He did, of course, yes. I'll try not to interrupt again. Well, I had no chance to intervene because I'd no sooner got a view of what was happening when there was one gunshot. Kerwin fell back, releasing his killer, so to speak, who took off like a deer. Across the garden, you said? Uh, to the left of that bush, yes, and uh, through the hedge there. I'll just have a glance at the escape route, if you don't mind. I always find it a help to get as clear a picture as possible of events. Forrester, I can't say I'm mightily impressed by your famous companion. Mr. Holmes's brilliance is a legend. And what's a legend? A fairy story? His successes are a matter of official record. Uh, perhaps he's simply passed his best. I'm sorry if I offend your reverence for a legend. A yeah, most pleasant garden, Mr. Cunningham. Very well laid out. A kind of you to say so, Mr. Holmes. All this was my late mother's work. She was the genius of this place. Ah. Now, Inspector, don't let my amateur interest detain you any longer. You wish to speak to Mr Cunningham's father, I believe. Uh, yes, if he's at home. Oh, certainly. Well, follow me in, gentlemen. It's a dreadful business. Dreadful. We won't trouble you long, Mr Cunningham. Burglary. Now, now murder. It's dreadful. And you didn't see the murder clearly, sir? No, no, thank God. But what you did see from your window confirms your son's view of the matter. Well, it would, wouldn't it? We were looking at the same thing. But from different viewpoints. 
Witnessing a violent crime can, well, be a disorientating business. And Mr. Holmes must have witnessed hundreds. You don't keep a dog, Mr. Cunningham. A dog? What's that got to do with it? Well, it simply popped into my mind. The burglar, apparently, had already broken open the door, but no alarm was sounded until Kerbin called out. Uh, we do have a dog. Old Prince, as old and feeble as his master. But he's chained up at the other side of the house. So it was fortunate Kerbin was here. Not so fortunate for him, of course. No. He was conscientious, was Kerwin. As you know, there had already been one break-in in the district. He'd obviously taken it upon himself to check the house. That may be so, but it is possible... This must be a most distressing time for you, Mr Cunningham. Burglary and murder on top of your other troubles. Uh, other troubles? Mm, this lawsuit between you and Mr Acton. I know how much time and energy <sighs> such contests can take. Oh, don't get him started on that. Mr Holmes, you're right. The interminable coils of the law. I'm weary of it all. If I could, I had let the matter drop. And what would my mother have said to that. If she were alive, she'd never yield to this Acton's impertinence. I tell you, Mr. Holmes, you may be his guest, but it's my opinion that old fool's addled in the brain. You may be right, Watson. Well, of course you are. Nervous exhaustion. But one can't help being a bit disappointed. A burglary, and then a murder, and one has Sherlock Holmes as a house guest. One would look for more fireworks. The last thing I want for Holmes at the moment is fireworks. You have great affection for Mr. Holmes. My admiration for him is profound. And he's your friend. I envy you that. Companionship, adventures. I see no one but business people and servants. You and I should have kept more in touch. You must come to town more often. If I do get to London, it's only to see damned lawyers. Writs and counter-writs, statements and denials, bills of sale a century old. A maze of legal niceties. Is managing your estate so complex? It's those Cunninghams. The Cunninghams? They're the ones who've led me into the maze. When Mrs Cunningham died, certain matters came to light. The essential matter being half of their estate is mine. Good Lord. I didn't mention it before because I'm heartily sick of discussing the business. But I have to go on with it. I'm in the right. And as for that arrogant pup of a son of his... Come in. Excuse me, Mr Acton, Dr Watson. Mm. Forrester, are you here to tell us all is solved? I'm afraid not, sir. I hardly hoped so. Mr Holmes sent me in. Where is Mr Holmes? Outside, in a field. A field? Striding around in a circle, sir. He seems very much excited. This is just what I didn't want. I'd best go out here. Mr. Holmes prepared this document, sir, which he asks you to sign. It authorises a reward. There's another for the Cunninghams. You look even more confused than usual, Inspector. Mr. Holmes is a very surprising gentleman. He has rather flummoxed me. One might almost say disillusioned. I couldn't go as far as that, Mr. Acton. Is the way he's behaving likely to turn up our local villain? I think even you've got a better chance. Would you care to sign the document, sir? Down among the local scum, Forrester. That's where you should be. Ferreting among the drunkards and layabouts. Not pestering me in my study. Certainly not prowling in my field. Ah, Watson, my dear fellow. Holmes, what on earth are you Your doing? country trip has done me the world of good. I've had a charming morning. First we viewed the court. Charming indeed, and a busy morning too, I take ah, it. Ah, busy enough, busy enough. I've seen some very interesting things. And now here, in this beautiful medicinal field, they've all come together in my refreshed and happy mind. Holmes, this <laughs> isn't wise. Oh, I lay no claims to wisdom. Merely high intelligence, keen observation, and a proper method. Now, that fragment of paper in the dead man's hand, that is of extreme importance. This is not your case, and you're not yet fit for it. I cannot live without brain work. What else is there to live for? What is the use of having powers, Doctor, when one doesn't exert them? Yes, but I'm afraid you overexert yours. Now consider, consider the paper in the victim's hand bore the very hour of his death, and whoever wrote it brought Kerwin out of his bed at that hour. Then it was torn from his lifeless hand. Why? Surely because it incriminated the killer. Holmes, you must and what would the killer do with it? Hmm? Perhaps simply thrust it into his pocket, perhaps <sighs> not even noticed that a corner of it had been left behind in the grip of a corpse. I beg you to calm you down. We must get our hands into the criminal's pocket. Forrester must catch him yes. first. Uh, we will see, we'll see. Let's join that promising young policeman and cheer along his investigation of this very peculiar crime. Come on, and mind where you tread.
good day once more, Mr. Cunningham. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I didn't expect to see you again so soon. Inspector Forrester is a most meticulous man, and he's consented to allow my friend and me to watch his review of this horrible crime. A horrible indeed. How do you do, sir? My name is Dr. Watson. Oh, uh, how, how do you do? So, Inspector, carry on. You were keen to hear again Mr. Cunningham's version of events. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, if you're not overly occupied now. No, I, I was simply pottering here. We, we tried to keep the garden in good shape. It was my wife's pride, but I can hardly keep my mind on it today. These terrible events have plagued me so. You were in your bedroom when Kerwin called out. Yes, I, 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 I was in bed, in fact. And you went immediately to the window? Yes. And what did you see? I saw someone running across the garden. Well, unfortunately, the ground is too hard for distinct tracks to be left. Yes. And yes. he got out onto the road through the hedge? Yes, just there, to the left of that bush. There's a bit of a gap in the hedge there, you see. He, he, he vaulted through that. Where the ditch is broadest. And so out onto the road, and then I lost sight of him. Ah, London celebrities here again. Your father's been going over the murderer's escape with me. Aren't you tired of hearing that story? Especially his vague account. Mine is clearer. I saw it all. Yes, let's see. Uh, you were in bed too when the alarm was sounded. No, I told you. I was sitting up having a last pipe. Uh, of course, of course, forgive me. Uh, so there you are, all at ease in your dressing gown, no doubt, enjoying your smoke when a horrible crime is committed beneath your very window. Right. And I ran straight down and I saw what I've told you a dozen times that I saw. It's a bit rich that I should have to endure this because you can find no clue at all to the murder's identity. Well, that's not strictly true. There is one extremely puzzling... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Mr. Holmes. Holmes! What's the matter with him? He's fainted. Holmes, are you all right? Can you hear me? The man's out cold. I was afraid of something like this. Help me lift him. Let's get him inside. <coughs> Holmes. Holmes. I think he's coming around. Oh, just take your time, old man. Ah, oh, so... Frightfully sorry. Ah, oh, uh, how long was I out? Only for a minute. A minute? How ridiculous. You said you were afraid of this. Is he prone to fainting? Uh, no, but he's been ill. I'd rather suspect him. Uh, the reward. We mustn't forget the reward. What reward? I'll leave that for you. Uh, you have the form I prepared, Inspector. Yes, but surely that can wait. Now, these things cannot be done too promptly. We should see to it while we remember. Yeah. This is the form here, Mr. Cunningham. It's 50 pounds is enough, I, I thought. And if you'd be good as to sign it, Mr. Acton's already done so. Oh, very well. I don't see the need for this uh, rush. I'll just step outside for a moment. Go, Holmes, no. Sit where you I are. I assure you, Doctor, I am fine. You see, on my feet and fighting fit. You most certainly are I not. I need just a minute alone in your blessed fresh air, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen. <sighs> this is absurd. I'm beginning to fear for that man's sanity. How are you? I'm all right, Watson. This can't go on. I assure you, my friend, all's well. When you're keeling over like that, total nervous collapse, all's well. Please be patient. There is an explanation. Then explain this. The document you prepared for the Cunninghams to sign, there's a mistake. You've got the time of the murder wrong. You were a quarter to one when it should have been quarter to twelve. Oh, yes. That's been corrected. Yes, Cunningham changed it. But that's hardly the point. The point is, the Sherlock Holmes I know would never have made such an error. Not the Holmes who so prides himself on his complete accuracy. What's You must accept that as proof. You're not your usual self. Oh, well, Mr. Holmes, fully recovered, are you? Thank you, yes. <sighs> Can we take it then that today's entertainment is over? Not quite. Uh, I was examining the scene again, and we must conclude that this was a most extraordinary burglar. Both you and your father had only just gone into your bedrooms, is that right? Well, a minute or two. So both your lamps were still lit. Yes. Yes, and this bold villain breaks into a house at a time when he can see from the lights that at least two of the family are still afoot. Is that not decidedly unusual, Inspector? It is, yes. I had mentioned... All right, so he was a cool hand or a madman. What of that? And you appear to take it for granted that although the door had been forced, the robber never got into the house. Well, we know that. Kerman stopped him. 
Yes, but might not Kerwin have tackled him on his way out of the house? Ridiculous. Surely, Mr. Holmes, if the man had already robbed us, we'd have found the place disarranged and, and missed the things oh, he'd taken. That would depend on what the things were. He's a most singular fellow, this burglar. Look what he stole from Actons. A, a letter weight, a ball of string, other queer odds and ends. Isn't that right, Inspector? Yes, and a volume of Homer. I can assure you none of my books are missing. But what else might be? I suggest we all go over the house together and make certain this erratic burglar didn't carry anything away with him. Oh, can that be necessary? And then will this be over? Almost certainly. All right. I'll lead the way. So, here we are. You sniffed around the kitchen, the drawing room and study, and, and these are our bedrooms. Oh, it's an attractive house. I fancy you must now try around for a fresh scent. Uh, that is my son's room. Uh, mine is the one beyond it. And surely, even if you are unwell, you can see it would be impossible for a thief to come up here without disturbing us. Uh, may I ask you to humour me a little further? Uh, I'd like to see how the windows of your rooms command the garden. If you must. Ah, yes indeed. Most attractive. And here you sat, smoking your pipe, and down there, murder was done. Yes, most interesting. And now your room, Mr. Cunningham. Very well. Uh, along here. Uh, the view from my window, obviously, is much the same as from my son's. Uh, obviously. Of course. But every angle is necessary to achieve the full picture. You can see how my father could easily lose sight of the fellow in the dark once he had reached the road. Mm. Now, Holmes, be careful! <coughs> oh, I say, Watson, you've done it now. What? Well, look at the mess you've made of the carpet. Here, let me pick up the glass. No, 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 no I'll get it. It's quite shattered. I hope it wasn't too valuable. No, no not at all. Don't, don't worry, please. Uh, th this dish here, uh, put it in this. Oh, watch out now, there are some sharp pieces. And watch out you don't step on an orange. I think one rolled under the bed. Oh, this is fine entertainment. Detectives at work. Uh, where's Mr. Holmes? Ah, slipped away in embarrassment, has he? He was right here. He said nothing. Yes. Well, there is no other conclusion. The man's off his head. I must ask you to mind your tongue, sir. Second opinion, is that, Doctor? Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Holmes. Forgive my brief disappearance, gentlemen. And now, Inspector, I'm able to ask you to arrest these men. What? Arrest whom? Both, Mr. Cunningham's. He is. He's mad. But on what charge, Mr. Holmes? That of murdering their coachman, William Kerwin, of course. <laughs> All safely dispatched, Inspector. Yes, Mr. Holmes. My men have taken them down to the station. Good. Well, I believe you and I have reached full agreement on the solution to this case. It has been enormously instructive to watch you at work, sir. Oh, I try to make it so. It's been a pleasure to have you with me. I'm often called in when policemen are out of their depths, which for many is their normal state. <laughs> You, however, proceed with an admirable respect for my method. I did make one serious mistake. I was too inclined to take Mr. Acton's advice, look down among the drunkards and layabouts. Yes, yes. You must make a point of never having any prejudices. Oh, I follow docilely wherever fact may lead me. But it's more than that. Imagination, too. Daring imagination. Ooh, careful now. You sound dangerously like a certain doctor I know. His accounts of my investigations often produce the same effect effect as if one worked a love story into the fifth proposition of Euclid. If I can do half as much as Dr. Watson to encourage the adoption of your procedures... Ah, yes, which reminds me. I must clear up certain matters with Dr. Watson and with Mr. Acton, who must regret the hour he took in such a stormy petrol as I. I'll leave you to finish the business with the Cunninghams. Remember, follow the facts. Analytical reasoning from effects to causes. And leave the romantic fantasy to chroniclers and criminals. You'll pay for this, Forrester. With your career, certainly. The Cunninghams are not without power in this county. Mr. Cunningham, are you recovered? Would you like more tea? Yeah, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And that meddler Holmes, he'll pay too. I'd like to begin by considering the ditch at the edge of your garden. The ditch? It is very broad where you claim the burglar crossed and moist. <sighs> Yet there are no footprints there. He, he was running very fast. He must have leapt over the ditch. 
Could he be so agile? It was Holmes that pointed you to the ditch, wasn't it? Where is that lunatic, anyway? There's no need for Mr. Holmes to be here. This interview is my business. I think, Mr. Acton, I shall help myself to a dash of your brandy. My strength has been rather tried of late. Of course. Please do. No more of those nervous attacks, I hope. No, no, my friend. But I'll come to that in its turn. Hmm? Ah! Oh, that's better. No, it's, uh, it's of the highest importance in the art of detection to be able to recognise out of a, a number of facts which are incidental and which are vital. In this case, there was not the slightest doubt in my mind that the key to the whole matter lay in the scrap of paper in the dead man's hand. But so little. Um, what was it? At quarter to twelve, learn what may be. Hmm. Now, from these seven words, it was clear to me it had been written by two persons doing alternate words. There were, for a start, the strong T's of at and two, which contrasted markedly with the weak ones of quarter and twelve. But why should two men write one letter? Well, obviously the business was a bad one, and one of the men who distrusted the other was determined that each should have an equal hand in it. <laughs> Ingenious. No, superficial. You may not know that even the deduction of a man's age from his writing has been brought to considerable accuracy. A writer can be placed in his true decade with tolerable confidence. Now, from that scrap, I could determine that one writer was a young man, the other advanced in years. Ah, uh, now we get there. Oh, we get further. <laughs> there was quite clearly something in common between the two handwritings. They belonged to men who were blood relatives. And that was most obvious in the Greek ease, but there were many small points which indicated the same thing. <laughs> All this from seven words. I'm giving you only the leading results of my examination of the paper. There were 23 other deductions of more interest to experts than to you. The shot that killed William Cohen. Yes, which we called you in to solve for us, only for you to drag in Holmes, who entangles us, the Cunninghams of Rygate, I remind you. By God, if my mother was here, she'd have you trembling. Oh. It was a revolver that killed him. It certainly sounded like one. Fired from a distance of over four yards. Do these details matter? All details matter, Mr Cunningham. In your account, Cohen and the killer were wrestling together when the gun went off. That is impossible. His clothes would have been blackened by powder. Oh, for God's sake, man, it was dark, it happened so fast, and I was witnessing a murder, which you said yourself can muddle a man. And I'm to be expected to remember exactly how far apart the men were? We are trying to build an exact picture of what happened. Using material given to you by a man who knocks over tables, asks about dogs for no good reason, and faints now and again. Inspector Forrester who will go far if he continues to follow my method, made one initial mistake. He began with the assumption that these county magnates had nothing to do with the crime. In the garden, he was about to tell them the importance of the letter. I thought it essential they should not even be reminded of its existence, and so, to, well, change the conversation, as it were, I tumbled down in a sort of fit. What? You mean all my concern was wasted? Your faint was an imposture. I do apologise, old man. Oh, you devil. I have to say, though, speaking professionally, it was admirably done. Oh, it's an art which is often useful. Another little ruse which I'm afraid rather embarrassed you was my toppling the table in Cunningham's bedroom. Ha, ah, ha, ha. A distraction. A rather messy one. <laughs> I'm rather lost here, gentlemen. Uh, you see, Mr. Acton, I was now sure young Cunningham had torn the letter from Kerwin's hand and almost sure he must have put it into the pocket of his dressing gown, which he was wearing at the time of the murder. I'd seen it hanging behind the door in his bedroom. I upset the table, and while everyone, including, I'm sorry to say, the good doctor here, was picking up broken glass and scattered oranges, mm. I slipped back to Alex's room, and there it was. Yet more incriminating script. The picture I now have of these two crimes, the burglary at Mr. Acton's and the murder of Coburn, is this. Pictures in your vulgar little mind don't interest me. Alec, please. Please what? Grovel to this shabby nobody. The picture is this. Two men broke into Mr. Acton's. Their intention was to steal some document which might be significant in a lawsuit. Oh, God. Shut up, Father. Don't interrupt the inspector in his fantasy. Unable to find the document, they carried off whatever they could lay their hands on to make it look like an ordinary burglary. William Kerwin, meanwhile, had secretly followed these two men and, having got them into his power, proceeded to blackmail them. 
One of the two criminals was a dangerous man to play games of that sort with. Dangerous, eh? He saw in the burglary scare that was convulsing the area an opportunity to get rid of Kerwin, who was decoyed to a certain place at a certain time, and then shot. And do you dare to insinuate that we are those two men? I don't insinuate. I accuse. Accuse away. As I've said, you'll pay for it. You have no proof. Do you recall Mr. Holmes's mistake on the reward document? Yes, a, a curious lapse. It was no lapse. No mistake. So, we now had the word 12 in Cunningham's hand to be compared with the 12 in the letter. More importantly, we had the letter itself. And what did it say? I have it by heart. It read, If you will only come round at quarter to 12 to the East Gate, you will learn what will very much surprise you and maybe be of the greatest service to you and also to Annie Morrison, but say nothing to anyone upon the matter. And who's this Annie Morrison? Oh, she is of no relevance to the case. A mere loose end, Inspector Forrester will no doubt tidy up. Mm -hmm. Poor Annie. A mere loose end. You recite the letter. Um, where is it now? Where it will do most good. To you and also to Annie Morrison. But say nothing to anyone upon the matter. It's over, Alec. Shut up, Father. What's the use in going on when they have I all this... I said shut up! Alec, please, he says sense! What sense have I ever had from you? Look at you! Cowering! Snivelling! Sit down. If I had that revolver with me now, I'd blow your senile brains out! Ali, for pity's sake! And yours too! Sit down! My mother, if she were here, would never lose half our estate. She'd never give in to this vulgar upstart. That's what lost us the game, not having her with us. No. You lost because you came up against Sherlock Holmes. And Inspector Bob Forrester. Well, Watson, our quiet rest in the country has been a distinct success. You do seem much invigorated. Oh, it's fit enough now to get back to London. And you won't change your mind, come with me. No. I think Acton would be glad of my company for a few days more. Hmm? You of his? Oh, you know how fine his hospitality is. And I'm sure he'd be the better for... Resonances of youthful days. Perhaps. Uh, Stout fellow. So, a few days, then back to Baker Street. Most certainly. Yes, excellent. Holmes, there's one thing. Indeed? When he fainted, or pretended to, it was to stop Inspector Forrester from mentioning the letter. Correct. Why hadn't you simply warned the inspector not to mention it? Ah, uh, there are two possible explanations for that. One is that I had been immediately impressed by that young man and was pleased to watch his growing understanding of the case. I wanted to guide him, but at the same time allow him to draw his own conclusions. This could only be good for him. I see. Yeah. And the other possible explanation? Ah, uh, that is that you, my dear doctor, were right all along. I was not in full possession of my normal astuteness and had simply forgotten. Yeah, till we meet again in London, Watson. Good day to you. Good day, Holmes. Take care, my friend. In The Rygate Squires, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams with Peter Davison as Inspector Forrester. Alec Cunningham was played by Struan Roger, Mr. Cunningham by Roger Hammond, and Mr. Acton by Terence Edmund. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Rygate Squires was dramatized for radio by Robert Forrest and directed by Patrick Rayner. <laughs>